I like these slow burn kind of things. You know, it's not this big dramatic carnival atmosphere. It's this very powerful slow burn. These are the most deadly kind. <laughs> My dad always said, if you're going to get in a fight, get in a fight with the biggest, loudest person in the bar and avoid the small, quiet person because they will kill you. <laughs> um, I feel like we're the quiet, deadly group. I love it. I mean that very seriously. Anyone can do big talking about stuff. But to stand up there and share like that and that kind of worship is the real deal. So I'm grateful to be a part of this. Thank you. It's an honor. Let, I don't know, two weeks ago? I don't know what, when we were. We were in Tennessee last week. Was that last week? <laughs> yeah. And uh, you were there, Steve. When was that? We were in Tennessee, East Tennessee, and um, <clears throat> we went to. Sp we were invited to speak in a middle school, public middle school, by a really great principal and his staff. And it was a rough school, seventh and eighth graders, wasn't it? Seventh and eighth graders. And uh, so he said, he asked us, "Would you guys come into our middle school? It's kind of, a, it's a, a, you know, a poor school." tough kids, um, and would you come in and talk about identity? But, you know, obviously you can't say anything Christian. Just come in. And he said, I'll get the, how many kids were in that gym? Yeah, like 800 seventh and eighth graders in this gym that was about 120 degrees. And he said, I'll get them all in the gym, and you can have an hour and 15 minutes to talk to them about identity. Seventh and eighth graders? An hour and 15 minutes? I wouldn't. I got bored. <laughs> Sitting on bleachers in a gym. And so, so we went in there, and Steve, no, he wasn't there. Steve wasn't there yet for that part of it. So we went in there with these teachers, these great, I, I love being in the venues that nobody cares about. Do you know? It's always where Jesus would be. It's not these high dollar, super... It's, this, it's seventh and eighth graders in this little town in Tennessee. It's like, does Jesus do anything in little towns? Like, does he come from little towns that no one's ever heard of? Yes. That's how you know it's him. So we go in there, and the superintendent of the schools came, and the, sh the county sheriff came, and uh, the principal, his name's Scott, He's this great guy. He loves these kids. And he loves these kids. These are famous people to me. These are, this principal is a famous person to me. Do you know who wins the world? The nameless ones. That's who wins the world. The nameless ones. Not the famous ones. The nameless ones win the world. That's why this is so powerful. Because it's not a bunch of egos in a room. It's people that want to see themselves transformed and God transformed the people around us and that God is like I'm all in for this let's do it uh, humility so I anyway we went in there and we prayed in his office and he gave us these t-shirts that didn't fit that say um, I am enough that was the theme of the day I am enough more than enough thank you that's how bad the shirts were I couldn't even read it I am more than enough thank you and uh, for wearing these shirts. It was really cool. And then, then praying with some of the teachers. And um, Anyway, we go in there, and they're just packed in this gym, all on one side of the gym, these amazing 7th and 8th graders. And so we spoke on identity. And what is identity? And they, they, they were, got so engaged in it. It was really beautiful. And anyway, we did that. And so Scott sent me, I know you can't really see he, the principal, he did a survey of the students afterwards, and he sent me these pie charts of their responses. <laughs> it was funny. And, and he, he, they asked, all the teachers asked the kids questions at the end. Um, and so here's a couple of the questions. Do you want to know more about your identity? What is that? 80.6% yes. 80% of 7th and 8th graders want to know more about their identity. Who's going to tell them? We are. You are. Um, he asked, 
do you wonder why you think the way you do? Can you imagine asking that to a seventh grader? Like, what? 67.2% said yes, we wonder why we think the way we do. Like, what? do you know who's gonna help them understand why they think the way, nobody. Social media, the enemy. Where are the believers? We're not in the public school. Anyway, then there's one other question he asked. There's a whole bunch of them here. Where's that one? Oh, yeah. He said, on a scale of one to five, five being the most, how well did you understand, this is not a fair question, but how well did you understand Jamie Winship's explanation of identity? 81% said four, we understood. No Christian language. We understood what he meant by identity. 63% said we clearly understood what he meant by identity. Then they asked the big question, how many of you want to know more about your identity? 85%. That's how white the fields are. That's how, pray for who? The workers. Where are they? I'm excited for you because as you're being transformed, there's a world out there longing, longing for transformation, dying for it at every level. And so these, this time together in this community, practicing transformation among ourselves together, it's training. That's what you're doing, you're training. It's, a, it's like I said from the very beginning, it's like a special ops team training training to live in the present tense, training to be open-minded, ready to ship, training for emerging kinds of reality. Can you come talk to seventh and eighth graders tomorrow? You can't talk about Jesus. Yes. Have you ever done it before? No. <laughs> Will you figure out what to do? Yes. When? Probably five minutes after we've started it. <laughs> because we can only live in the present tense. Right? Not afraid to fail. Failure, the thought of failure energizes us to new levels of creativity. That's what Jesus is teaching the disciples to do. That's small teams that can go into any situation and just move with the spirit. But it's not because we're just, it's magic. We've trained to do it. Come up on a stage, cry and say what God said to you. Not many people will do it. We train in doing it we, so that when God's like, okay, you ready? Here we go. Because God can't invite us into these things because we don't know what to do. We don't know if he speaks or not. How, how, where, where can he send us if we don't even know if he speaks to us? How is he going to speak to seventh and eighth graders when he doesn't even speak to me? Right? So we're training. This is what discipleship is about. It's not filling in blanks in a book. And asking each other how much you sin. It's training to be who you really are in the kingdom of God. That's what it is. And then God's like, ready? Let's go. He takes his disciples up into the Galilee for two years and trains them. Train, train, train. Practice, practice, practice. Learn that you cannot die. Learn that God still speaks. Learn to walk upright in your true identity. Learn not to listen to what Satan says. Learn to only speak the words that the Father says. Learn that you always have access to God. Learn that you have the mind of Christ. Learn, learn, learn. Ready? Down into the conflict we go. Unafraid. Here we go. We might die. We might get killed there. You cannot die. Remember the training? You cannot die. You cannot fail. Ready? Let's go. That's what you're doing. That's what we're doing here. That's why it's so important. So we're looking at Gideon here. I want to make sure I do this, get through this. this so, we're, so reading the Bible. So word of God, spirit of God, people of God. This is the training. Word of God, spirit of God, people of God. The whole word of God, not just the graphe, not just the text, but the rhema logos, the whole word of God. All of the word of God with the spirit of God for direction and critique and energy. And then the people of God, community. 
So I say there's no superstars in this thing. It's community. It's the ones in Hebrews that were sawn in half and never saw the promise, and the world is not worthy of them, those people, those real pe believers, those it's that life. And so when we're reading the scriptures, it's like, here's examples of how it works. Here's the case law. Here's the precedent on how it works. Here we go. Pick an example. Read through it. So we're looking at Gideon and Israel right here. Israel is living as victims. Their national identity is victim. What's the identity of your country? We're victims. It, it, it. Yeah, another topic. We're victims. Don't get into politics. This is not the right time. So they're victims. They're living as victims. Why? And they're blaming the Midianites. Like the Midianites keep coming in and stealing all our stuff. Those foreigners, when they come into your country, they're just going to take all your stuff. I know we don't think like this, but that's how they were thinking. We got to keep the foreigners out. We need a policy of keeping the foreigners out because we plant the crops. They come in and take them all. That's the situation here. It's the Midianites' fault that we're in the position that we're in. And so they've decided how to deal with the Midianites. We're going to hide from them. There's a strategy. We're going to hide from them. We're going to real, work real hard, plant the crops. They're going to come. We're going to hide. They're going to take all our crops. And we're going to do the same thing next year. And the year after, we're going to this compulsive repetition. We're just going to keep doing this fear loop. We plant. They steal it. We hide. Next year, we plant, they steal it, we hide. Next year, and God's like, really? Like, you're just going to let this happen. You're not going to come to me and ask me one thing about it? We're not sure if you talk, and this is such an amazing pattern. Like, <laughs> where we've learned to really s survive in this. We've learned how to cope with it in our fear. And this is the pattern we're going to conform to. Because we won't present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, and stop conforming to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you'll know what to do with the Midianites. Like, stop just trying to survive this thing. It's not that fun. And so they, they cry out. They call out to God, and then he, he, this process kicks in. It's not a formula. It's a process. And this process kicks in once they call out to God, once they say, we're in trouble, our thing isn't working, so good to say to God, this isn't working. Let's all just say it isn't working. It's not working. We're not, it's not working. Like we can just go, oh, you just want to scream it out. It doesn't work. What we're doing doesn't work. And God's like, finally, truth tellers, finally. And so they tell that, and so what God sends is a truth teller to them. And the prophet comes to them. And he reminds them of what's true. God is not the one that put you in bondage. God delivers people from bondage. Who is telling you that God puts you in bondage or abandoned you? He's the one that brought you out of bondage and gave you this land to live in. That's the true God. And then he warned you. I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites. And then they're like, oh, you mean the Midianites aren't the enemy? No. What is the enemy? Your fear of other gods that you think are stronger than God. And in our, in our age, it's the God of finances. It's the God, those gods, the God of what people think about me, the God of, of what I can produce. That's the gods, and we're afraid of these gods. And we live in fear of them. And so we live in, in hiding. It, it, our true identity is hidden somewhere in a cave inside of us. It can't come out because we're victims. I could lose my job. I, like this kind of thing. And so the truth teller comes, and he says, here's your real, real problem. You are afraid of other gods. That's what's ruining you. And I told you not to be afraid. I told you not to do that. Fear leads you into this kind of predicament. And so the truth teller comes, he speaks the truth, and then he says, finally, you have not 
remember the obeyed is the English word, the Hebrew word is shema, which means to listen to or hear. You have not listened to God's voice. You have stopped listening to God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. He's the only one. Don't be afraid of other gods. No, there are no other gods in your life. No one has control of your future except God. Why do you live like someone else controls your future? But you have stopped listening, obeying. Remember, the prophets say obedience is better than sacrifice. Hearing is better than sacrificing. God's like, stop sacrificing to me and listen to what I'm saying to you. Stop tithing to me and doing things for me. Do what I ask you to do. Jesus says it. Beware of these Pharisees and Sadducees. They, they love being in the synagogue. They love wearing the fancy clothes. And they give large sums of money. Beware. Because what they're doing is out of false identity. And then the widow walks up and throws in her little bit. There's a giver. Because she's giving from her true self. And it's better than all of this nonsense of we gave this much. Makes me sick, God says. You're making me sick. Stop sacrificing and listen to what I'm saying. What a relief. We have this prayer that we do with our people as we pray every so often. Lord, what are all the things I'm doing for you that you never asked me to do? It's a long list. Satan is very good at telling you things God wants you to do. And the way we know God's not asking us is it's a burden to us. It exhausts us. And we, we've been saying, lay it down. Jesus is like, who told you to carry that around? Lay it down. And only carry what I tell you to carry because that is light and you can do it and you can work from rest instead of being exhausted all the time carrying around burdens that I never asked you to carry. What a relief. That's good news. And so the prophet comes, so the, the process is this. We cry out, we confess, we tell the truth. The truth is told back to us from God, which is repentance. And in this process, in, in, even in Judges 6 here, the next thing that happens is that once truth comes, then the issue of identity comes up. Once we, we, Lord, this is not working. This is not working. I'm telling the truth. This is not working. I don't know where you are. I don't see this working. I'm miserable. I'm unhappy. I don't, I don't, I don't think you care about me. There it is. There's the confession. The Lord speaks truth back to you. I am here. I'm the one that brought you safely to here. I've always been with you. I've never left you. I've never forsaken you. you but you haven't listened to what I'm saying. You've lost your identity. And so here comes the true identity again. And so in, in Judges here, it says, who brings the identity? Who leads the nation into true identity? Jesus. And so after the prophet leaves, it says, now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the tree, which belonged to Joash, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord we believe, is the pre-incarnate Christ. When Jesus, Jesus is God that we can see. That's what this is. It's the Im image of the invisible God, the angel of the Lord. This is Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus, is standing there now to speak directly to Gideon. That's why when you close your eyes and say, God, who am I? Jesus is the one we can image. That's why we do this. And so the angel of the Lord is there, and the angel of the Lord will only speak to Gideon. Listen, he will only speak to Gideon in Gideon's true identity that God gave him. That is the only way God will ever refer to you is in the identity that he gave you. If you think God is calling you a sinner, you are incorrect. That is not, he does not accuse people of things. He's not an accuser. The enemy is the accuser. God will only call you what he created you to be. And so that's what the angel of the Lord says. 
the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. The two things that Gideon does not believe, that the Lord is with him and that he's a courageous, mighty man. He doesn't believe either of those statements. So now he's in a place of repentance. Here comes the angel of the Lord to speak truth to him. Here's who you really are. Here, here's who you really are, and here's the state of the situation. You are a mighty man of valor, and the Lord is with you. And Gideon goes to explain why that's not true. You ever do that to God? He's like, You're my, you, are, you are a daughter of the living God. And you go, well, I, I'm going to disagree with you on that one, Lord, because... And then you list all the reasons... So Gideon says, and Gideon said to him, I love this, please, sir, if the Lord is with us, then why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds? Sarcastically, he says, sarcasm, humor, and others' expense. Where are all the wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring you out from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us. Like, do you know who you're talking to? The Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. <coughs> the Lord is standing right there. The Lord just said this. The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Well, we don't think the Lord is with us. I don't believe that. Because if the Lord was with us, it would look like this. And it doesn't look like that. It would look the way we think it ought to look if the Lord was with us. And so he gives the reasons why that can't be true. Here's how the angel of the Lord responds to false statements. And the Lord said to him, go in the strength that you already possess. The Lord didn't even respond to the false statement from Gideon. Doesn't even respond to it. Okay, but I know, uh, but I'm so, uh, you don't understand, God, I'm so. And then you do your speech, and the Lord's like, what now? Okay, go in the strength that you have, because he can't speak into falsehood like that. He can't talk falsely about you. He can only say what's true about you. And the Lord said to him, go in the might that you already have. Do you know what Peter says? You have everything pertaining to life and godliness. You have everything pertaining to life and godliness. When? You have it now. What are we asking God for? What are we asking him for? You already have it. This Gideon. When does Gideon become a mighty man of valor? When the angel of the Lord shows up? Nope. The day he was born. When did he gain all this strength? The day the Lord shows up? Nope. The day he was born. And all the Lord is saying is, do you not understand who you are? You must not. Because here's what I want to know about you. Why is my mighty man of valor, who has the strength to beat everyone out there, hiding in a cave? How is that coming? How, how did that happen? Who is your main advisor in life? That you've now decided, as a mighty man of valor, that really no one can stand against, that you are a coward. Who told you that? Who called you that? And why do you believe it? That's what he's doing. This is what Jesus does to people. All through the Gospels, this is what he's doing to people. He's calling out their true identity. Who told you this? Who said this about you? Why do you... The, the prostitute comes up to him. He's like, who do you... Why are you acting like this? I'm a prostitute. Who, who said that? Well, the men that pay for me, they call me a prostitute. So? And I do things that prostitutes do. So? And the Pharisees right there, some of whom are my customers, they also call me a prostitute, and they so think I'm a prostitute that they can't believe that you're letting me touch you. And Jesus is like, I don't make prostitutes. I don't, I don't care what anyone calls you. I don't even care that you call yourself that. Here's who you are. You are my daughter. Here's my question. Why is my daughter acting like a prostitute? Go and act like my daughter and stop separating from me and from your true self. Go. Daughter, daughter, daughter. He's yelling to her out the door. Daughter! And then he looks at the Pharisees. That was my daughter that you are insulting. That's my daughter. 
That's how, he ta- that's how he wants to talk to you. What does he call you? And so the angel of the Lord comes. Gideon has this. Then the, the Lord said to him, he said to him, if I have found favor in your eyes, okay, if I found favors, show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come and bring you. So here he goes. God doesn't mind about these things. He doesn't care. God, can you just help me understand this? Can you help me get this? Can you prove this to me? Okay, yeah, all right. Do you know how many times Jesus will do a lesson with you until you get it? As many times as it takes. He doesn't mind. What he can't stand is the falsehood. The lies. That's what his wrath burns against, is the falsehood. God's wrath is poured out against falsehood. If you understood the wrath of God which proceeds from his love, you would get up every day and say, burn me with your wrath. Burn away the falsehood right now, because I'm sick of living in it. Burn it away with your wrath. He loves doing that. He loves burning away your falsehood with his wrath. Not you. He doesn't want to burn you up. He made you. He wants to burn up the false you. And boy, you just get to like, can we just save time? We just burn it away right at the beginning of the day. So we stop entertaining it. That's what he's doing. And so Gideon's like, so if you found favor, so Gideon went to his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes. He comes back, and the angel of the Lord said, take meat and unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour out the broth over him, and he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out to the tip of the staff in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes, and fire sprang up. And it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. It was an amazing time meeting Jesus up here at the ranch, at the rodeo. Like he touched me up there. Jesus met me up there, and I said, how do I know it's really you? Do you mind just, like, moving my heart? And he will. He wants to. If you're not doing this to him, come on. Say it. Come on, Lord, say it. He will. He wants to. And then Gideon does that, and the experience happens, and Gideon understands his identity, and boom, the angel of the Lord is gone. Jesus is gone. Once that identity is established, Jesus is gone. Look at the next thing that happens. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived, and he said, the angel of the Lord, and Gideon said, alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. We met Jesus that, that's what I love about working with the Muslims. It's like they didn't meet Jamie and Jamie explained the gospel to them. They met Jesus. They won't die in torture because I did a persuasive speech about Christianity to them. They won't die for that. But they will die when they've met Christ. Oh, we will die for that. Right? And he knows that. Then Gideon built an altar and called it, the Lord is peace. I love that. The Lord is peace. Who's making an altar of peace? A mighty man of valor. He's making an altar of peace. It's incredible. To this day, it still stands. That night, listen, what's next? The angel of the Lord, identity. We tell the truth. The prophet comes. He tells us truth. We speak truth back. The angel of the Lord comes. Jesus shows up and calls out true identity in us. Then Jesus is gone. What's next? That night, the Lord said to him, once you've met Christ, do you know who you have access to now? God. Jesus is the way to God. In your true identity through Christ, now guess what you have access to? All of God. The eternal, uncreated one. That night, the Lord said to him, not the angel of the Lord, the Lord. We can hear God, yes. The Lord said to him, take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, pull down the altar of Baal. Here's what the Lord says when he shows, Jesus comes, let's walk into your true identity. I died to bring you into true identity. Let's walk into it. Here's what it is. We're experiencing this with Jesus. And then we move towards the fullness of the Godhead. And here's what God says, no other gods in your true identity, no other gods ever again. You will not fear any of these fake gods ever again. Get rid of the other gods in your life. You will have no other god before me. So go tear down 
the altars. And guess where they are? They're in your house. It's not those bad guys over there. It's your house. That's where it is. Tear down the altars to the false gods in your house. In your house. That's what God says. Jesus comes to lead us into the fullness of God. And when you're in the fullness of God, there are no other gods. There are no other gods. Tear down the... And I, I don't know, it, it's pretty creepy when you're praying to God and say, God, show me the other gods in my life because I want to tear down the altars to them. Mm. Boy, then you're going deep. And so Gideon... He's got to go pull down the altars to it that, that for his own family, his own people. And he is, he's just trying to walk in the mighty man of valor thing. It's fresh. Okay, now go tear down the altar, mighty man of valor, and the strength you already have. Like, yeah, oh my gosh, can I do it at night? Like, is that allowable? And it's like, okay, do it at night. I don't care. Daytime, nighttime, doesn't matter. Do it. But he doesn't go to do alone. He brings 10 other guys with him. Oh, movement. Suddenly, movement. Not a coward little guy hiding in a cave. Now, the real identity, bringing others into the movement. Just a small number. Just a few up at the rodeo. Them. And what are we going to do? We're going to tear down the other gods. We're going to destroy them. Where first? Right here first. Yeah. Right here first. Because I know my identity now, and this identity doesn't need these other gods anymore. I don't get my identity here anymore. I get my identity from here. I'm not afraid of this anymore. We're tearing it down. Sanctification, the beautiful process of being transformed. Tear it down. And so he tears down the altars. Then the men of the town said to Joash, bring your son that he may die. First he's hiding in a cave, afraid of the Midianites. Now he's out doing things that cause other people to want to kill him. That's how fast he's becoming the man of valor. Coward on Tuesday, man of valor on Thursday. Taking on his own town now with his friends. Wow, impressive. Why? Because I'm walking up right in my true identity and I'm not going to fear these other things anymore. I'm tired of it. We're tearing it down. So the people say, bring him out that he may die, for he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. But Joash, his father, uh, suddenly becomes brave now. The man of valor is making other people people of valor. His identity is leading other people into true identity. How many people does it take to lead others into true identity? And his father, but Joash said to all the Sud, who will contend for Baal? Or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him contend for him. Now you're going to smack talk the other gods. You're not even afraid of them anymore. Now you're just going to mock them? Yes. Why? Because we're men of valor. Where'd you learn that? Gideon. The Baal Buster. That's what his nickname is now. Baal Buster. That's a cool name. Who will contend for him? If he is God, let him contend for himself because his altar has been broken down. They broke down Baal's altar, and guess what Baal did? Nothing. Do you know why? Because he isn't really there. It's not. Who's afraid of Satan? Who? Nobody. Really? But we all act afraid. Unless one person's not afraid. And then suddenly, wow, huh. One person, wow, they're not afraid. Maybe we don't have to be afraid. And all of a sudden, everyone starts getting brave. Here's the cool thing. In your, we, we were doing this over in the group over here. In your true identity, your identity brings that thing to the team. Right? So if my identity is militant peacemaker, no one else on the team is a militant peacemaker. That's what I do on the team. When there's conflict, my identity springs up. It's called for it. God's like, we have a conflict. Militant peacemaker, you are now up. No one else goes, is it my turn yet? You know by your own identity, it's not your turn. There's no competition and no comparison on the team. Conflict, who's our conflict guy that you're in? We were just doing this over here today. Once the conflict is resolved, I'm done. Sit back down, Jamie, thank you very much. No superstars here. You come in when there's conflict. When there's no conflict, you sit down. 
we need mercy now. Who's our mercy person? Boom, the mercy identity jumps in. It's their day. Till mercy is done, you can sit down. Compassion, please, next. And the team just moves in and out like this in this beautiful, we all love each other. And we got to have every identity engaged. We need a compassion identity. Where is it? And our compassion identity is living in fear suddenly. The whole team has to stop. Let's go over here. You need to take care of that person because you have to have them. So we stop everything and care for one another. We need you in the game because we can't win without you, please. What can we do to serve you? How can we help you? How can we encourage you? You okay? Here we go. Ready? Ready? Okay, go get them. And then we, there she, there they go. Then they're done. Like that's how a team works. That's what Paul's saying. There's hands and feet and none's better than the other, but we got to have them all. And so Gideon's just moving in his own identity, and it's activating courage because he's the courage guy. We need the courage guy in here right now because everyone's afraid. The courage person comes in, and everyone starts to draw off that identity. Oh, wow, I feel braver. And when the mercy gift, like, I feel more merciful with you here because that's your, that's, you're the champion of that. And it's so beautiful. And you, like, don't even have to pray. Is it my turn yet? Are we doing mercy? No, okay. Don't even have to ask, do you? No. There's no jealousy. There, all that's gone. And so that's what Gideon's doing. And they name that place, well, let, let Baal contend for himself because he broke down the altar. Here's the pattern. Here it is. Call out in truth, confession. The truth teller comes. Reminds us of the truth of who God is. Jesus shows up, calls out true identity. Once we're in our true identity, direct access to God, we're rescued, saved, whatever that is. Now I have direct access to God. God's on the scene. Get rid of all other gods. Let's go. Get rid of all other gods. We purify. Wow. And now we're not afraid of these other gods because now we're with the real God. We didn't know he was that real. We didn't know he was still alive. We didn't know he lived here. Yeah, there he, and then the real God is leading and we're destroying all the altars within the side of ourselves. We're moving out in power. People are getting braver because the brave person is up there in their gift, in their identity, and we're all following that. And the outers are cleared out. What comes next? Here's what comes next. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together and they crossed the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Look who's next. But the Spirit of the Lord, oh, the Spirit now. Hmm. See that, Jesus? God, now Spirit. There they all are. The whole community of Father, Son, and Spirit. Here they all are. What activated them? Truth. What set them into motion? Truth. Who's the truth? Jesus is the truth. See that? It's like, now, but the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. And he sounded the trumpet. And the Abyssalites were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh. And they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher and Zebulon and Nephtali. And they went out to meet him. What does the Spirit bring? Unity. Single-mindedness. Unified. Let's move forward as a whole people. Truth. Jesus. Identity. God. No other gods. Spirit, unified, we all fight together as one, and we go, and we win. There it is. That's the process. It's that every day. You could do this process every day. Am I telling the truth, God? Am I speaking truth? What is my true identity? Why have I lost track? Why am I afraid? Lord, what is my true identity? Jesus is there. You're my militant peacemaker. Live, uh, you stand upright in your true identity. You're my militant peacemaker. Thank you. What is stopping me from believing that? Other gods? Other things that you're more afraid of? Get rid of them. Okay. Spirit clothes us. Now unify with the rest of the identities and go take the island. It's yours. It's always been yours. You can have it. But you can only have it in your true self with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit fully engaged in each one of us. There it is. There's, it, there's it's being explained, and the rest of the Bible just keeps explaining it, and there's Jesus. And Jesus comes on the scene, gets his identity from God, filled with the Spirit, Father, Son, Spirit, go get the enemy. Go get him. It's yours. Take it. Don't be afraid. There it is. That's what we're practicing. That's what we're training in this. 
every day, all the time, until it's just second nature to us. We, we have the mind of Christ. You have the spirit of the living God. You have everything pertaining to life and godliness. You just don't believe it. But it's not information that can be plugged into your head. It's revelation. It's experiential. You have to live in it. You have to experience it. It has to go from here down to here and work out out there. And then like, you know what? This is actually true stuff. But you'll never learn it in a library. It's got to, you learn it out here. Standing up here, doing what Greg did. Worshiping like Nate and the band. That's it. Get on your knees. I love that. Get on your knees. Why? Because the true God is here. No other gods. The true God is here. Yes, get on your knees. It's funny, my Muslim friends, they would say to me early in the days, and I really understand like what we were doing before I met Dave. And, uh, and, and in fact, Muhammad, the guy I was with when Dave was leading the study, he was sitting next to me one time, and he says, hey, Jamie, you're a Christian, right? Yes. I've never been in a church, but I've looked at magazines. And do you guys really like, 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 do you just kind of sit back and like put your Bible on the floor and stuff? And like put coffee cups on the Bible? I've seen pictures. I'm like, uh, yes. He goes, yeah, but we're reading the Bible together. And it seems like when God shows up on the scene, everyone falls face down on the floor. It doesn't look like in the church you're really thinking God's going to show. Wow. I was like, wow. We don't really think he's going to show. That's the challenge of having a person from another tradition with you. That's the value of having them in the room because his view of God was more holy than my view of my God. God's my best friend. And his God is holy. And it's just the balance of all of that. This stuff is real. This happens. And so I, I want you to think about this. So that, think of that process right there. There it is. So when we read it, this has to work on Monday morning. It, has, it can't just be a topic on Sunday. This has to work in real life on Monday morning in the worst day with no one else there. Just you and the Trinity. That It has to work. If it doesn't work, it's kind of a waste of time reading about it. Like, why are we afraid to say this? Does this work or not? Well, how would we know? We go out there and we try it, right? That's what you do. So I, we, I was teaching this. We were living in Atlanta at the time. And some of you might have heard some of the stuff we did. At it. So in Atlanta, we were in this ch big church. And they had a new young guy that was going to take over men's ministry, which was pretty non-existent in the church. And so it was like 5,000 people in the church. And... 14 men showed up for men's ministry on Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. Um, and so this new guy was assigned to run men's ministry. We had just come into Atlanta. We knew the pastor. And the young guy says, will you help me with men's? He asked me, will you help me with men's ministry? I say, I don't really do men's ministry. I don't, I'm a militant peacemaker. But, I mean, I, if there's a conflict, I'll help you with it. And so, so, we, so he said, just come. And so I went there, and I just stood up, and I said to the 16 men, like, why aren't your friends here? Really, I was just curious. Like, why aren't your friends here? So we, what we got to start with is truth-telling, right? Where are your friends? Why aren't your friends clamoring to get into this men's study on Tuesday morning at 6 a.m.? Here's a hint, 6 a.m. That's one thing, but... <laughs> um, but why aren't your friends here? Well, they're busy. Lie. Lie. I, I, I could get a famous person in there, and all of them would be there at 6 a.m. on Tuesday morning. That's not true. They're not too busy to come. Why are they not here? Say the truth on why your friends aren't here. We didn't invite them. Good. Why didn't you invite them? Guess why they don't invite their friends? It's boring. It's irrelevant to their lives of the friends that they have. Like it doesn't work. And I said, OK, thank you for that. Finally, they said it. And I said, here, here's, let me just, this isn't a, Typically, here's what a men's ministry is about, the topics. I'm just asking them. Like, I've been out of the States for a long time, but isn't this basically what you do in a men's Bible study? You study marriage, parenting, finances, and pornography. Isn't that basically the main studies that you do in a men's Bible study? Like, yeah. And you just repeat them, right? 
pretty much. You just keep going through those. How many of you feel really good about your parenting skills? How many of you feel really strong in the marriage area? How many of you like are killing it with the finances? I'm not even going to ask about the pornography thing. I'm just not even going to ask about it. But do you see it's this, it's this compulsive cycle. What's the men's ministry about? Parenting, marriage, finances, and pornography. That's basically what we're doing like this. Is that what Jesus would be talking about? If you came at 6 a.m. on a Tuesday, do you think you'd be covering those issues? What would he be talking about? Who you are. Who you are. That's what he would be talking about. So I said, how many of you think God actually communicates to you? What if, what if this whole thing was about actually God speaking to us while we're here? Would you come to that? They're like, yeah, yeah, we'd come to that. Okay, well, let's make it about that. Let's just come together and see if God will speak to us. How about that? Yeah, okay. So we start doing that. And then, then we start writing just weekly a little study on hearing the voice of God, which we've never done before. But we thought, well, let's write one. So we were, and they would come, and then it started to grow. In fact, in D.C., they did a survey in the D.C. churches, and they asked men, if you could learn anything about God in the church, what would you learn? 90, no, no multiple choices, just that question. 98% of the men said, we would like to hear God speak to us directly about issues in our life. 98%. Here's the problem. 98% thinks that's not taught in the church. Like, they didn't, that's not being taught. And it's not in a weird way. It's like just normal, can, can God communicate and I can figure it out in my rational mind kind of thing like that. Not anything weird, dramatic, blown out of proportion, misused, all that stuff. So we just do this study like this. We're doing, and each week it grows. And guys start bringing their friends. Like, it's pretty interesting. You know, we're doing this thing about hearing from God. Really? Yeah. What's he say? I don't know. You come listen. And so they start coming, and we start doing these questions, and let's just listen, just practice listening, and it's not dramatic, and let's just see what happens. And the thing just keeps growing. So we, it, it grows over 500. It keeps going. It expands out into other parts of Atlanta, this goofy little thing we're doing, beautiful little study, just to us, just like what y'all are doing, and it just keeps growing. And so in that time, I meet the most fascinating people because they come up to me, and they're like... Do you think God would talk to me about? And then it would say an issue. And I'm like, I think he pretty much talks about anything. I don't know. I don't think he has anything like that's off limits. I think, isn't it funny how we think about God? Like, it's like he can't hear them when they're asking me that question. Do you think God <laughs> would talk to me about? like that? I'm like, he just heard that. So weird. We're doing things that don't make any sense, but no one ever says anything truthful about what we're doing. We just keep doing these funny things. Anyway, so this one guy comes up to me, and he's a stutterer. He's a really bad stutterer. And he says, he asked me, can I come meet you at your house? I want to ask you a question. Yes. So he comes over to our house. He comes in, and uh, his name's Kenneth. He comes in, and we're sitting in our house. And he says, um, I want to hear God speak to me about my future. And he has this really severe stutter. And I said, OK. We could have done it over there. Like, it does not more, it's not better at our house. Um, but we can do it here. So he said, I just don't get it. I don't understand what's happening. I would say, it's just real simple. I'm just going to, I'll, I'll ask a question. And you just tell me what comes to your mind. That's all. It's not, okay. We do it together. And I said, here is the interesting thing when you're praying with men. Uh, uh, the, here's how you know that, here's how you know they're hearing from God. This is what they do. That's what they do. <laughs> it's exactly what Gideon did when the angel of the Lord talked to him. You're my mighty man of valor. Now, I, no, that's not true. And so everyone in the Bible, when God's talking to them, start telling God why what he just said isn't correct. That's a theme in the Bible. How do you know it's God talking to you? This is what you'll say to him. What? Like, that ain't going to work. That's how you know it's God. Here's what you say to Satan. This is what, this is what you do when Satan's talking to you. You're a terrible husband. I know. You, you, the, there's other men in the church that are so far superior to you as father. I know. That's what you do when the enemy's talking to you. I know. Yep. Here's God talking. You're one of the most amazing husbands I've ever seen. <laughs> How did we get to this? Do you know why? Because what God says to you takes faith to believe. 
And what Satan says to you never takes any faith to believe. That's how you tell the difference between the two. And so I, we pray and Kenneth's going like this. And I'm like, well, clearly God's talking to you because you're telling him, no, that's him. What do you hear? Just tell me what you hear. Let's forget about it. Let's don't try and figure out if it's God. Let's just, just say what you, well, I'm embarrassed to say it. Okay, well, that's also him. Keep, what does he say? I was like, it's, it's too, like, high. That, that's definitely him. It's better than what you thought. Yeah, that's him. Um, what did he say? I think he said that I'm an internationally famous scholar. I'm like, yeah, that sounds like something God would say. He didn't say loser. That's Satan. He would say that. <laughs> You're in, he goes, how do I know that's God? I'm like, when's the last time you got up and looked in the mirror and said, I think I'm an internationally famous scholar? <laughs> Ever? No. That's God. Do you call yourself that? No. That's him. He's the only one that would think that crazy thought about you. So I said, so an internationally famous, internationally famous scholar, he was a fifth grade math teacher that stuttered. That's who he, that was his current. I said, well, okay, so to go from a fifth grade math teacher to an internationally famous scholar, okay, God's called you by name. What do you have to do to become that, right? This is what this is. I actually had this quote down here. This is what, we got to quit making this stuff magic. It's not magic, it's real. Listen to these quotes right here. The intuitive mind, this is Albert Einstein, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift. This is Einstein. The intuitive mind is the part of your mind that can go above the rational to think in ways that the rational can't do. It's called, Einstein calls it theoretical physics. In order to understand relativity, he had to go past the confines of what was known about physics. He had to transcend it above the rational into the intuitive to think outside the conformity patterns of the world. He had to leave German school in order to explore what was happening in his mind because the school wouldn't permit him to think that way because he was breaking the rules of physics. He had to, so he has to go out here to stop conforming to the patterns of current physical thought and be transformed by the renewing of his mind about physics. It's a human capacity that all humans can do. It's not magic for Christians. Every human can do this. Here's what Einstein says. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant to the intuitive but we have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. We've made the rational mind the master and the intuitive mind is gone. Do you know what happens when you only think with the rational mind? You do compulsive repetition because we can't think of anything new. We're not allowed. You can't think of that. Why? Because we don't think about that. And so you're stuck in the rational. The rational doesn't understand love. The rational doesn't understand grace. The rational doesn't understand forgiveness. The rational mind can create the industrial revolution. It's great at that. It can make things faster, smaller, quicker. It re can recreate dead things really well. But the intuitive mind can transcend the rational and be with God in the unseen real so Einstein's in seventh grade, he's back there going, wow, if I was riding on a lightning bolt, that's his intuitive mind in full gear in his true identity. And out of that, he figures out special and general relativity, and then he pulls them down into the rational and writes a paper on it so other physicists can figure out what he's talking about. Intuitive to the rational. Prayer and explaining what happened in your prayer life to your friend, rational up into the intuitive. And the Hebrew writers call this meditation or prayer. What are you doing? Accessing the mind of God. About what? Anything. Physics, education, governance, religion, all of it. But we don't do that. Here's another quote. It is through, these are famous inventors and mathematicians. It is through science that we prove it is through intuition that we discover. Do you understand that? If you're going to discover things about God, they're up in the intuitive mind. That's where they are. 
And so we go up into the intuitive mind. That's what when they're playing the worship music, we're going to we're going to do this with the other team later, but when you play worship music, think about your vocation. Like what is it? Up in this intuitive, very beautiful contemplative state, like what's another way to think about talking to seventh and eighth graders about identity without using religion? The intuitive mind is where you go for that information. And you know who meets you there? God. And then you have these ideas and they're very powerful and beautiful. All humans do this all the time. And then you bring it down in the rational and on Tuesday in Tennessee, you say it so that a seventh grader can understand what you're talking about. Mozart, when he's commissioned, can hear the entire symphony in his, mind, in his intuitive mind, the whole thing. Clarinets, I hear the clarinets, I hear the violins, I hear the cello, there's the drum. He can hear the entire symphony, but then he has to sit down in the rational and write every note, or nobody can play what he heard up here. Is what he heard up here real? Oh, yes. But nobody can access his intuitive mind until he brings it down to the rational and says it. This is what Jesus is doing. He's like, I'll be off in the intuitive mind for a short time. I'll be back. And he goes off to be with the Father. And that's what he's doing. He's way up here with the mind of God. And then he's like, oh. All right, how am I going to explain this to these disciples? Okay, it's like a bird uh, and a field. Like, that's what he's doing. He's over here. He came from the kingdom. He li Jesus is from the kingdom. And they're like, what's the kingdom like? He's like, well, phew. They're like, is it, is it like in us or outside of us? And Jesus is like, yes. And like, I mean, but they're like, is it, is it future? Is it present? Yes. Is it like real or is it spiritual? Yes. Like, it's, he, how can he explain it? And so then he just starts in the rational. He starts going like, it's kind of like a field. It's kind of like that. He's using the rational to explain the intuitive. That's what he's doing. Listen, let me say this again. It's not magic. It's what humans can do because we're created in the image of the God who is up here in the intuitive. That's one last one. Intuition is the supra logic that cuts out all the routine processes of thought and leaps straight from problem to answer. These are mathematicians saying this. They're, these aren't pastors. All human knowledge thus begins with intuition, proceeds through concepts, and ends with ideas. That's a prayer life right there. That's what it is. When you say, God, what do you call me? Oh, off you go. Good luck. Let us know when you're back. And enjoy it. Up in the intuitive mind. Up in the intuitive mind where Columbus goes, you know, I'm thinking the world's not flat. No reason to believe it, really. I just, I know the facts say it's flat, but I just think up somewhere above all this, it's not flat. I'm going to bring it down to the rational. Let's go see if it's not flat. And then he, off he goes. What? Like, that's how the human mind was made to work. And if you, but if you separate that mind from God, you crash down into the rational and you can't get out. And I'm a victim. And these people own me. And there's nothing I can do about it. Because I can't get back up into the creative mind of God that's never limited. You are a world-famous scholar, Kenneth. Way up here. And down in the rational, he's like trying to say it. I think I'm a world famous scholar. Well, how would that work out on Tuesday? You heard it up there. Beautiful. Bring it down. How do we get to it? He's like, I don't know. Well, can you be a world famous scholar and lecturer and be a stutterer at the same time? I don't see how. So maybe that needs to go first. Do you see? But now he has a reason why not to stutter. I'm a stutter. No, you're not. You're a world famous academic. Let's figure out where the stutter came from because it didn't come from that identity. And so we go after the stutter in the rational with God. And I don't have time to tell you, he stops stuttering. Do you know why? Because his true identity doesn't stutter. 
his false identity does because no one wants to hear what he says and he keeps cutting himself off when he talks. He learned that as a kid. We don't want to hear what you say. He would start to say something to his dad. Oh, yeah. Shh. And he, he learned that speech pattern. And waiting for someone to tell him to shut up. He's 30 when I'm with him. He's still doing it. We got it. Jesus meets him in the time when someone was telling him to shut up. I want to hear you talk. Talk. And he starts practicing talking, but it's a long life of him just shutting up. And he's got to reroute the neural pathways and all that, and he's got to learn. We want to hear what you say. We Take your time. We want it. And he starts to do it. And he needs a PhD, so we got to go to school. We're in the rational world. we got to do it. No, I just want to magically be an international. Can you just pray over me and I just become one? No, no. That ain't in here. That ain't happening in here. you got to go knock down the bales. You really have to do it. Can I do it at night? Yeah, but you still got to do it. Monday, they got to be gone. It's not magic. It's not a special service. And so he enrolls in a PhD program, practicing not stuttering, and he starts acting like an internationally famous scholar. He starts becoming, as Kierkegaard said, with God's help, I'm becoming who I am. When were you an internationally famous scholar? The day you were born. When did I have the strength? The day you were born. When did I have the stutter? The day you believe the lie about yourself and separate it from who you really are. And then sin. And bore, frustrated and feel stupid and all that other stuff. And he's practic and he goes, he goes into the PhD program in math, in statistics. God help him. In statistics. God. He's excited. I'm in a PhD program in pure statistics. I'm like, Thank God there's other identities in the world because <laughs> he loves it. He's energized by statistics. And so here's what he does. He, he, he decides to write his PhD in the intuitive mind. Why? Because other famous geniuses, that's how they write. From the, they go up into the intuitive, they meditate on it, they bring it back down and demonstrate it in the rational. And so he writes about statistics with all of his training, all of his learning, all of his own mind, and then he lays, he would, he would come over and he would lay down his first chapter of his theory of statistics, and he would go, Jamie, read it. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. And read it. And then we read it together, and then he goes, okay, God, this is what I know about statistics. What do you say? And we sit there. God, talk about statistics in a way we don't know them yet. He never said, God never said one word to me in those times, ever. It's not my identity. But I sat there with my brother. I hope you're having a good time, Kenneth, because I am bored. <laughs> can you have a conflict? And I can get involved in that. But And so he's in there. He's like, oh, my God. And he's making notes in the margin. <laughs> Doesn't God only talk about Bible topics? No. God talks about all topics. He's the God of all topics. Like everything you ever want. Is there another way to think about politics? Yes, there's a million other ways. And so he's making these notes. He goes back, he revises it. That's how he wrote every chapter. What he knows, and he's smart, man. He wrote what he knows, then he says to God, anything else that you would add? Anything else? This is called inspiration. He's being inspired. He's writing down these new ideas. He takes it to his advisor. His advisor's like, what in the world? What? Where are you getting this from? His, his advisor doesn't even know what it is. It's like, what is this? He wins the gold medal in the United States for P the best PhD written his year. If you want a partner in writing a PhD, God is a really good partner. <laughs> he wins the gold medal, and they, because he wins the gold medal in this topic, the most famous statistician in the world contacts him. Who's in Israel? The guy's an Israeli, genius in Israel, University of Tel Aviv. Zero Kenneth, I've read your PhD. I must meet you in person. 
because I need to understand where you got this from. How did you come up with this theory of statistics? Kenneth calls me. Jamie. I just heard from the greatest human being alive. Like, this is his, gr like, I wasn't that impressed. Like, the world famous, I'm like, really? OK. But to him, it's like he, if he could meet anyone other than Christ, it would be this guy. And, th and that guy was in Israel, too, so it was close, like that. <laughs> and he was Jewish, so eh, just barely. And so the guy wants to meet Kenneth face to face. And Kenneth's like, this guy is my, like, hero. I'm like, do you have a poster of him? No, but he's my hero, and, and I'm going to meet him. And so we, me and Donna, lived in Israel at the time. Like, so we were going back and forth. We had started going back and forth while he's in this whole process. And so we're over there, and I, and <clears throat> I say to Kenneth, when you come over to meet with him, I'll go with you. Because Kenneth was like, you know, if you can imagine meeting whoever your greatest idol is, Kenneth was like, you know, I was afraid he wouldn't be able to talk. Like, we're going to sit and talk about pure statistics, just me and him. I'm like, great. <laughs> So he says, so Ken Kenneth and his wife, Wendy, they come over. And so before that meeting, this, this is a little subset, parenthetical part of it. Kenneth, Kenneth in, comes to, I take him into the West Bank. Me and Donna take him into the West Bank. I want you to see the Muslims that we work with. Kenneth's like, whatever, good. And so we're in this hotel, staying in this hotel in the West Bank. And I say to Kenneth, Kenneth, what are the odds statistically if we walk out into the West Bank here with all these zillions and millions of Arabs, and look for an Arab who has been praying for a long time to meet people like us to tell them about Jesus. What are the odds of that? He's like, I don't even, I don't even know how to think about that. Okay, let's see what happens. So Lord, would you lead us to a Muslim out here who's longed to know you and we could be a part of that process? Would you invite us into that? And Kenneth and I are just going to go walk around and see if we meet that person. How much pressure is there? I mean, that's like, is God, we, we're ready. You want to invite us in? Us? We want to be there. So we're going to wander around all day, me and Kenneth. And would you just blow Kenneth's statistical mind on this? And so he and I, Kenneth and I are walking around. We go out there. We're walking around in this Arab market. You know, lots of people. I'm standing there. We're looking at cactus fruit. I'm explaining it to Kenneth. And this guy next to me goes, in English, he goes, hey, are you guys Americans? And I'm like, yes. And he goes, are you Christians? And I said, maybe. <laughs> like, I don't know what that means, right? I don't know what he means by Christian. I like, yeah, you know, maybe. What are, are you a Muslim? He goes, perhaps. <laughs> Good. And, uh, and this is my friend Kenneth. He's a world famous international scholar in statistics that only he and one other guy in the world care about, but he is. Um, and the guy goes, uh, are you staying in the West Bank? Yes, we are, right over here. I would love to invite you to my house for dinner. I look at Kenneth like, <laughs> all right. And so I said, yeah, love to. He said, um, okay, can you meet me here? You know, and he said, we set the day, meet me here. We'll wait for the bus. We'll get on the bus. We'll, we'll go up into the hills where I live. I want to introduce you to my family. Yeah, we'd, lo yeah, we'd love to do that. Kenneth, yeah, wouldn't it? Kenneth's like, that's amazing. We leave. I realized that I gave him the wrong day. Like the day he told us to meet him, we're going to be gone to meet the statistics guy. So I'm back at the hotel, and I was like, that's the wrong day. We're already going to be gone. I'm like, oh, shoot. Kenneth, what are the odds? Because I don't know the guy's name or any way to contact him of going back and finding that guy again to tell him to change the day. Kenneth's like, I don't know. So we go out, and we just start wandering around. Like I, the guy's gone. I don't know where. And we're just wandering around this city, wandering, and I was like, there's a coffee shop right here I really like. Let's go there. We were in that coffee shop. We come out, boom, there's the guy standing right in front of the coffee shop. And Kenneth, what are the odds of that? Kenneth, statistics, what are the odds of that right there? <laughs> and I tell the guy, I told you the wrong day. He said, how did you find me? And I'm like, we just, honestly, we just asked God. To, and the Muslim, he does this. It means that the eyes of God must be on him in order for us to reconnect again. Thus he goes, oh. And, and then he, I said, it's the wrong day. It's, we, you know, and he, we set it up. We get, we get our, down on, in Wendy, we go, we get on the bus. In the bus in the West Bank, you just sit on the bus until it fills up. It could take three hours to fill up. So we get on the bus, me, Kenneth right behind me, Donna and Wendy, and then the guy's right in front of me, this amazing Muslim guy. And we're, you know, it could be three hours that we're sitting there. And see, he turns around and he goes, 
can I just ask you a question? Yes. He goes, I've been, I've been asking God for two years to send me somebody that can explain to me this thing about Jesus. I look at Kenneth. What are the odds of that, Kenneth? Right there. What are the odds of that? Statistically speaking, what are the odds of that? And I'm like, you know what? We were asking the Lord that he would let us meet you. And the guy's like, you're kidding, no? We go up to his house. We have this amazing time with his wife, his daughters. He walks us through up in the hills there in the West Bank. He walks us into this monastery up to a statue of Mary holding Jesus. And he goes, I come here every day and ask God, explain to me this. Explain to me this. And he goes, I've been praying. I can't ask a Muslim. I don't know what to ask. I've been praying for some kind of Christian to come and just come up to me and meet me. And here you are. And we stood there at that statue and explained to him the birth of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. Yeah. Then, then, then we go the next day to Tel Aviv. We're in this restaurant in this mall next to the University of Tel Aviv. And this statistical hero sits down with Kenneth and he goes, how did you do this? And Kenneth says, well, I wrote what I knew and then I would lean back and I would access the mind of God on statistics and listen to new ideas and I would write them down. And the, and the guy's just... Because, see, it's not like, is that real? The guy's looking at his PhD going. The guy goes, I'm a, I was raised an atheist. He said, I was raised an atheist. He goes, I'm not an atheist because I've explored it and figured it out. I was just raised that there's no God. I've never questioned it until right now. And I'm looking at something that you, as an absolute genius, have written down, and you're attributing statistical theory to a relationship with a God that speaks to you? Yeah. Kenneth is like, exactly. <laughs> and the guy says, I'm writing a new book on statistics. I would love to include you in the book with what you've written. And the, right then, Kenneth became an internationally famous academic. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, this is real stuff. I mean, you could say it's not. I, I don't know why you would want it not to be real. This is real stuff. And this is a real God. And, here, and the real God is interested in normal people, regular people that just look at him and say, what do you call me? Truth tell. Jesus comes to reveal identity. Jesus gives us direct access to the God said, you will have no other gods that you're ever afraid of ever again. And then the real God sends the spirit that draws us together in unity and says, go, be an internationally famous academic and win the place. Go, go. He's saying that to us tonight in each of our own identities. Let's just pray for a second. Lord, thank you for Kenneth and his wife, Wendy. For Khalid, Lord, the guy on the bus and his wife and his daughters. Lord, thank you for these amazing people. But Lord, most of all, thank you for being the God who speaks to us. You're the God that spoke to Abraham when he wasn't even looking. And not only did you speak to him, you just started blessing him. You said, just if you will move the way I tell you to move, I will make you a blessing and you will be a blessing to all families of the earth. Like, what kind of God just shows up and starts promising us blessing? He's not demanding that Abraham make him promises. He's making promises to Abraham. This is, we're, we're grateful to this, Lord. We're grateful that you demonstrated your love to us and that while we were separate from you, you died for us. You did it. And it, that in Christ, we could be alive and free forever. And not just go to heaven when we die, but like live now in the kingdom. Like live in this amazing life where you can meet a guy that's been praying for two years that you would show up. And we could be a part of this amazing thing that's going on here on into eternity. And Lord, we're just grateful. It just makes us worship you. 
And we know that the greatest form of worship we can do is to live in the identity that you gave us. That's our greatest act of worship to you, is to be who you made us to be in communion with you, worshiping you alone. And we're just grateful. And Lord, what an honor of all the places I could be right now, I could be right here with these amazing people that I've been able to meet. And, and these people whose identities are stunning to us, me and Donna and our Steve and all of us. It's stunning to us. And we're so humble to be here with these people. And what's going to happen here, Lord? And that our lives could be linked with them in the future. And it's just amazing. We didn't plan this. We didn't know that we would be with 7th and 8th graders in Tennessee that are gonna, whose whole lives are going to be different because you met them there in that gym. We don't plan. You, you invite us into this stuff, and then you do it. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. You invite us into it, and then you do it. God, thank you for this. We receive, we receive, we receive from you. We want everything that you offer, Lord, everything, at every level. Yeah, in Jesus' name, amen.